Are we in the midst of a modern reformation? And is Ken Ham its leader? Ken Ham constantly calls for a modern, a new reformation. He, he sees himself, likens himself as following in the footsteps of people like Calvin and Luther and other great reformers. I want to take a look at that claim uh, through some recent words that he's written on uh, Twitter and on Facebook. And eventually I'm sure it will show up on the Answers in Genesis website as his own personal blog there. And this isn't the first time he's talked about the need for reformation within the church. And that that reformation should be led by a calling back to the original interpretation of Genesis. So let's take a look at his most recent semi-rant on this particular topic. And then what I plan to do is I plan to go to a blog post that I wrote several years ago when the Ark Encounter was just about to open. And he claimed that this Ark Encounter was going to usher in a new reformation in the church. Let's see, did, has it done that? Has it been successful in ushering in a new reformation to the church? I guess this first line is a title, sort of a title of his, his, um, his latest thoughts. How do we need God's people today to call the church back to the authority of God's word? Just over 500 years ago, the Reformation was initiated by a German priest and a professor named Martin Luther and continued by others such as Calvin and Zwingli. Luther's nailing of the famed 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg began the Reformation in October 1517. It was a movement that called the church back to the authority of God and away from the fallible opinions of man, which had severely compromised the clear teachings of the Word of God. The Bible upholding movement was so powerful that today we're still experiencing the effects of this historical earthquake that spread from Germany all around the world. Throughout history, whenever we witness a great work of God, our adversary, the devil, the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience aggressively tries to undo this work. All right now he's going to liken himself to like what he's doing is a continuation of this reformation started in 1517. And of course he's being opposed, right? He's being opposed by the devil who's working through both atheists and non-Christians to try to bring him to his knees. But maybe most importantly, he's most upset about other Christians who are not following in his footsteps and, and heeding his words. And that to him is the most dangerous and the most disconcerting part of this modern reformation and the most likely reason it could fail in his mind. So I'll cover that in a separate hand bites because that's a separate uh, blog post that he's written about that. But continuing on here about the reformation. Now, what he's, I'm not going to read all of this. What he's going to do here is he's just presenting uh, a, a typical story of what the, where the authority of Scripture comes from and then where the original, the original sin, right? The original sin of doubting the authority of God goes to show how Satan undid some of the original uh, efforts of the Reformers and continues to work to undo the, the Reformation from the 1500s. Then, of course, gets up to Darwin and talks about how Darwin was one of the ultimate underminings of the church and the authority of Scripture was undermined by Darwin and so forth. So he gets down here. As I've stated many times, evolution, millions of years, is a religion attempting to explain life by natural processes without God. It's an atheistic religion, and sadly, so many church leaders have adopted aspects of this anti-God religion and attempts to mesh it with God's word in Genesis. So for Ken Ham, it's really just, there's two sides. It's either you're all on board with the authority of Scripture or you are undermining the authority of Scripture. It goes on to explain how, you know, the millions and billions type stuff is un, is, is, has been undermining the church and that, of course, church leaders have fallen for this stuff and that has caused even bigger problems. So inside and outside the church, the Darwinian revolution changed the hearts and minds of generations concerning biblical authority. It's all about this word biblical authority. Continues on about how this devastates the church today. People are leaving the church because of this undermining of the authority of scripture because of Darwin, right? And then even more so, America's once very Christianized culture is now being divided by aggressive secular philosophy, right? And a Christianized worldview. Everything's a dichotomy. Right? It's either his particular form of authority of Scripture, even though there are many, many Christians who also believe and subscribe to the, the authority of Scripture, right? 
but don't accept his particular interpretation of scripture as being the authoritative understanding of, of God's word. Sadly, compromise in Genesis has undone much of what the Reformation has accomplished. Right? So the Reformation accomplished so much, but we've been backsliding ever since, losing the things that were gained in the, in the 15th, 16th, well, 16th century. And what Ken Ham's here for is to usher in a modern Reformation. All right, so many of our church leaders need to repent of compromising God's word. One of our AIG scientists, Nathaniel Jeanson, PhD in cell biology from Harvard, loves to say that, loves to repeat that over and over and over again. A few years ago, launched what I consider a groundbreaking book titled Replacing Darwin, The New Origin of Species. Of course, we've talked about that book quite a bit and others have reviewed it. All right, so get that title. If you, if you don't know about this book, Replacing Darwin, The New Origin of Species, it sounds like it'd be a really important book, right? Sounds like this, I mean, this book is some five years out now. Um, why haven't you heard of it? All right. Why isn't this shaking the foundations of the world? This was the new reformation in terms of, of correcting the, in, the, the wrong views of Darwin from a scientific standpoint, right? His, his, his cultivated scientist on his, uh, on his staff wrote this very provocatively titled Replacing Darwin. He's, he's the one that's going to replace Darwin this with this new origin of species i believe that this is the first major book to carefully research and offer a direct frontal attack on the very essence of the arguments of darwin used to promote evolution right to try to try to address darwin's like main arguments and to overthrow those arguments and replace it with a new origin of species one based on biblical principles now here's 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 ken ham quoting dr jensen Right, about his ambitions and what he what he set out to do and what he claims he has done many times uh, since then. The goals of replacing Darwin are audacious. Yes, they are. To effect a scientific revolution and to set the research agenda for the next 50 years. In other words, replacing Darwin seeks to accomplish a goal as big as its title. Provoke a scientific shift in the, of the same magnitude as Darwin's seminal work did. Wow. Right, so, Jensen's claiming that his work is a ground shifting work on the scale of Darwin's origin of species. He added, replacing Darwin is unique and unprecedented is a unique and unprecedented book in modern literature. It draws on the latest scientific research and tells three scientific accounts that have never been put together in one volume anywhere. Furthermore, the book is structured in such a manner that anticipates and answers evolutionary objections to its claims. Since the origins debate inevitably converges on spiritual themes, the afterward presents the gospel in a manner that flows directly from the preceding chapters. He further explains, so this is, this is uh, again, Ken Ham using uh, Gene Sun quotes throughout in his defense of, we need a new reformation. Since the vast majority of scientific community rejects creation science, replacing Darwin not only challenges and equips Christians with powerful and startling scientific information, it is written in a way to especially reach non-Christian creationists. Free of Christian and creationist jargon, the book assumes a readership that is resistant to its message. Via 10 chapters of detailed scientific content, the book begins at ground zero in 1859 and then builds the case for creation while building credibility with the reluctant reader. I don't know of any reluctant readers that have read the book. I mean, if you're a reluctant reader, you're probably not going to read the book. But I mean, if, if you were forced to read the book or you promised to read the book, I don't know how many have been converted by his book that are not Christians. I hear people who will like say, like, oh, Dr. Jensen, this book was great. It really helped me out, really helped me understand these, these things. But there are always, always young earth creationists who are saying that, who, who have stumbled around at, with how to answer questions, and they feel like Dr. Jensen's provided them with some answers. Yes, this groundbreaking book includes an in-depth in-depth scientific content, but even if you don't understand some of the technical material, you will grasp the basic arguments against evolution that people need to learn today. All right, so I don't want to go on a long rant about his book. I can direct you to posts that are written about it and other reviews of the book. Needless to say, there's not a lot of discussion of replacing Darwin, right? Five years later, uh, I did a search just recently for like just discussion of the book, of, of anyone who's referenced the book, 
of anyone who's reading the book, who anyone who's talking about the book, anyone who's discussing it on YouTube, anywhere, like in the last six months. And it, you can barely pick up a whisper of discussion about this book. And maybe the most telling thing is, I've really not seen this book referenced by other young earth creationists, right? Outside of Answers in Genesis, right? Where, where Nathaniel Jensen is, right? Other creationists haven't jumped on this like, wow, this is a revolutionary book, right? I mean, Jensen's claiming this is a replacement for Darwin and it presents a scientific hypothesis that can be built upon, right? His dream is that every other young earth creationist is going to pick this up and say like, I'm going to run with these ideas and I'm going to start doing my own experiments on organisms and I'm going to show how his ideas can be played out uh, in a, in a uh, well, they can, they'll fill in the gaps, all right? Of these, of these laid out ideas, much like the Genesis flood, right? By Whitcomb and Morris is a very kind of just, um, it's a very um, aspirational book in the sense that they don't have a ton of data and they got a lot of ideas. And the idea was to stimulate thinking and to have people sort of like get all excited about it and fill in the gaps, right? I just don't see that, that happening. I mean, that's probably the best evidence that even young earth creationists aren't convinced. And certainly nobody outside the young earth creationist uh, community thinks that this is a new revolution, right? That thinks that anything has started from what Nathaniel Jensen has done here. And so, but anyway, we're back. This is Ham Bites. We're talking about Ken Ham, but Ken Ham has included these quotes in here as sort of a way of saying, uh, we've, you know, my organization, like the person I've handpicked to hire here, who, uh, who's going to undermine, see, he's, he set up this thing. Like, why do we need a reformation? We need a reformation because Darwinism has undermined the original reformation. All right. Undermine the authority of scripture. And therefore we need to, um, one way to begin this reformation is to replace that thing that is Darwin, right? So replacing Darwin, that's why it was such an important book in Ken Ham's mind. That's why he, he likes to reference it. Uh, and although I'm sure he sold some copies because every time he mentions it, they sell copies of the book. I don't see any effect from that. All right. It's not starting a revolution uh, by any means. Right. But this is, this is what, Ken Ham thinks he's doing um, through his support of Nathaniel Jensen here. All right, so then this is Ken Ham back now. Yes, this groundbreaking book. Oh, sorry, that was Ken Ham that was already speaking, right? Saying the groundbreaking book includes in-depth scientific content. I, that's, that's not very in-depth. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of, uh, he says it doesn't have a lot of jargon, but there's a fair amount of jargon in it. And I know people who have read this book I know, I know Young Earth Creationists got, were really excited about this book when it came out. Like, this is going to be like the best things in sliced bread for Young Earth Creationists. And they get the book and they're like, what is this thing about? Like, they get halfway through it and they're just kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, that was really interesting and all that. But you can tell they don't really understand um, his, his, his arguments. And I know a few Young Earth Creationists who were going to, who were going to like go on this whole thing and do like a whole bunch of different videos and talk about it and like, you know, work out the hypotheses. And it just kind of like went nowhere because it was so boring, right? And, you know, for their audience. And I don't think they really understood what was happening. I don't think they really understood what Jensen was saying. But that's a tangent, all right? My point, as Ken Ham says here now, my point is that a lot of information now available, there's a lot of information now available so we can all be part of helping start a new reformation, right? Look, we've provided all this technical information. Like we have a PhD from, from Harvard and he's kickstarted us on this new way of understanding the origin of species, which is going to undermine what is one of the most fundamental dangers to um, Christianity, which is, which is Darwin. Right. And we're going to, we're, we're up, upheaving that. So that is the beginning of a, a new reformation. Right. And, and so we provided all this information. So it's like the, the time is prime now it's, we're ready to go. All right. Not just from this book, but from thousands of other AIG, uh, others that AIG makes available. And those are thousands of articles we've written over the last 15 years or eh, around 20 years at this point, uh, when he's writing this, you know, have provided the foundation of another, a new reformation. So I urge you to help us start a new revolution, a new reformation, a creationist revolution to undo the destructive consequences of Darwinian revolution. Beware the devil's attack. 
So he ends with three verses that speak of the dangers of how the devil, how, how everything he's just said, of course, is going to be attacked. Right? Everything he's just said is going to be uh, disconcerting to others who are worried about this Reformation and want to stomp it out. Right? And so he ends there at the, very, uh, at the very end. Indeed, a lack of knowledge exists among God's people today. Right? Most Christians are ignorant. They're ignorant of our literature. Because if they had our literature in their hands, then you know, this wouldn't be a problem. Right? We, we would be standing firm. You can help solve this major problem because, by becoming equipped with the information AIG provides and disseminating it to as many people as possible. Now, let me go to a blog post where I, I react to Ken Ham's calling for a new reformation back in 2017. And let's see some of the words he used there in description there. So here, here we are at my blog, Naturalis Historia. And I wrote this article, Ken Ham's Ark Encounter Usher, to usher in a modern-day reformation. And I'm just going to go ahead and read some chunks of this thing here. And I'll put a link to this particular article if you want to read the rest of it. Ken Ham would have us believe that the modern reincarnation of the Young Earth Creationist Movement, which he claims is only 55 years ago, right, is the real deal this time. We're really getting it right. This, this, this thing that I'm leading here, or at least now that I'm leading, not, not originally, um, is the real deal. It's the real reformation. It's the real young earth creationist movement. Unlike previous attempts over the past 300 years, right? It's been 300 years since this thing that we call creation science was kind of originated sort of with Woodward and a few others, uh, in the 1600s. All right. And that thing was to create a history of the earth with a recent global flood as sort of the centerpiece explanation for the observations we make of the world today in terms of both geology and of organisms. This time, this new reformation is starting where? It's starting as a parachurch apologetics ministry, Answers in Genesis. All right. It's, it's going to usher in the real reformation. The Reformation we've really been waiting for for 300 years, right? It's going to return the world to what he thinks is a proper understanding of Earth's history. And what's the centerpiece? The centerpiece of this new Reformation is the life-size model of the Noah's Ark, right? Which he's constructed in Kentucky, right? I'm writing this right at the time when he's uh, just about to finish, right? And I'm getting ready to actually go down. I, I visited the Ark Encounter about a week after it opened. Now, a couple of years before this, Ken Ham had a teaser article about the Ark Encounter, right? And it was right on the top page of Answers in Genesis, and it proclaimed this. As the wooden pegs were hammered into our beings on May 1st, so he's talking about the, the very first wooden peg, right? The inaugural wooden peg that began the construction project. I saw the event as part of a continuing reformation to restore biblical authority that started in when? It started in 1961. Now, what's he talking about when he says this return to biblical authority started in 1961? So it's, of course, the 1961 reference that catches my eye. Like, what is he talking about? Well, that, what, he's, what that is, is that's a re reference to the Genesis flood. That's the publication date of the Genesis flood, the, art of the, the book by Whitcomb and Morris. Right, 55 years after the publication of the classic book, The Genesis Flood, which really started the modern day creation movement. This is the way Ken Ham thinks about it. He thinks of 1961 as being the beginning of the, notice here, the real creation science movement. It's real because it's by folks that are more like him, not like the ones that started the creation science movement before him. All right, so, like I say, notice the word really. We're really starting the Reformation, right? This continues a tradition among young, many young earth creationists or modern creationists by ignoring their own intellectual roots. Yeah, sure. The Genesis Flood, that book, probably is the best known expression of modern creationism today. But it certainly wasn't novel at the time. Whitcomb and Morris simply just modified the work of a Seventh-day Adventist, George McCready Price's writings from the first decade in the 20th century. So 50 years before, much of what they wrote in the 1961 book is just a recapitulation or a, you know, straight up plagiarism right, from Price's book. 
Price is student and a number of other Seventh-day Adventists, and that's the problem. It's a Seventh-day Adventist originated modern version of young earth creationism that was then captured and brought into sort of a more mainstream evangelical um, uh, following of Whitcomb Morris and then eventually leading to people like Ken Ham. Price had a student and a number of other Southern uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, followers who wrote numerous books and tracts on flood geology and what they called at the time the new creationism. In the 1940s they formed the Deluge Geological Society. And of course, the Deluge refers to uh, Noah's Flood. And that, what, you know, what did you have to do to join this club? Well, you had to, you had to believe that the creation week was six little days long, right? And the Deluge could be studied as the cause of the major geological changes in creation, right? There's, if you look at the mountains and you look at valleys and, and the position of different rivers and so forth, in other words, the geography of the earth, they believe that that could be understood and should be understood as having been formed during this global flood. Now, if you go read on the Answers in Genesis website, I'm sure you could be forgiven for thinking that the Genesis flood was really the origin of young earth creationism, or a modern version of young earth creationism. Most leaders in today's creationist organizations prefer to distance themselves from a heritage that probably they probably don't feel especially close to theologically, especially given the association of the original creationists in the early 1900s and the work of Ellen White. Thus, they rarely acknowledge the origins of the principal tenets of scientific creationism or that there was a significant creationist culture presence in elements of the church prior to the publication of that book. The Genesis flood is a recapitulation of naturalistic mechanisms to explain a recent global flood that has already vetted, discarded by hundreds of scientists for over hundreds of years, but continually gets repackaged once again over and over and over as sort of a necessary means for upholding biblical authority. Now, I recommend that the real history of modern creationism, I mean, you can quibble with a few things in this book, but most people would say it's very well documented. And even Henry Morris and others have said that it's a fair representation of the history of creationism at the time that he wrote it. All right, would be The Creationist, From Creation Science to Intelligent Design, written by Dr. Ronald Numbers, who unfortunately passed away recently. Numbers was himself a Southern Day, uh, a Seventh Day Adventist, all right, and he's written extensively about Ellen White. So he was really in an excellent position to kind of understand the history of modern creationism and did a tremendous amount of research that is part of his academic field. So if you don't have time for that particular tome, all right, and which I do highly recommend this book if you really want to understand sort of the 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 the, the origins of young Earth creationism or modern young Earth scientific creationism. So I'll tie this into Ken Ham's modern reformation thing in just a moment. So I'm just giving some more background. The hypothesis that all geological formations and the fossils found within them could be explained by a global flood, that's been proposed repeatedly for some 300 years. It is varied in the details, but at the core, the arguments really haven't changed a whole lot. Whether it's Woodward in 1695, the mosaic geologist in the early 1800s, or members of the Seventh-day Adventist in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The arguments, both scientific and theological, really haven't changed a whole lot. Those hypotheses have been discussed, debated, and I'd say dismissed over and over and over again by many natural historians, by Christian geologists, by the scientific community, and I'll say the vast majority of theologians, the vast majority of pastors, the vast majority of church leaders. So, as I initially stated, Ken Ham would have us believe that the modern creationist movement, this time, after so many previous attempts, is now the real deal. It's the real reformation. It has really come. Unlike all those other attempts to create a history of the earth with a recent global flood as a centerpiece, this time it's going to usher in a real reformation that both in both science and a return to the interpretation of biblical authority. Hence his emphasis on Nathaniel Jensen's work trying to usher in a new understanding of a replacement of Darwin. He even compares his young earth creationist movement with the Reformation kicked off by Martin Luther in the 1500s. For example, Dr. Whitcomb. Having Dr. Whitcomb hammer his peg into the beam at our ceremony reminded me of Martin Luther almost 500 years ago when Luther hammered his thesis into the wooden door of a German church and proclaimed biblical authority. It started the Reformation. 
Does Ham believe that all other attempts to establish a recent catastrophic global flood were unable to bring about reformation because they were not sufficiently accurate interpretations of the geological record? Or maybe all other attempts were led by Christians that weren't as sort of like theologically orthodox as he perceives himself to be. They didn't quite have all the answers from Genesis, correct? And thus the Holy Spirit really didn't bless their work, right? I mean, if they've always fallen away, that means the Holy Spirit hasn't really continued to prolong the efforts of these past iterations of young earth creationism. Now, of course, Ken Ham, as we saw in his, in his, uh, his extended tweet, you know, ends with all the things the devil is doing. And he constantly talks about how the devil's trying to undermine things. So that's what he would blame. He'd simply say like, here's, here, the, here were good efforts, but the devil was stronger in that case. Very much fits into his eschatology and so forth. The, the world is really running down. It's, we're really not going to be terribly successful, but we have to try, you know, we have to reform as much as we can, but we know the devil's really gonna win in a, in a in large sense. And we're simply going to be raptured out or taken out of this world eventually and escape from this hellhole. Oh, sorry. Got off track there. <laughs> it's like, why should we expect that this latest attempt to promote a previously rejected flood geology hypothesis will bring back a full appreciation of biblical authority? I would suggest it won't. It won't because creation science is at odds with good biblical scholarship. And I'm going to say it's not a real product of taking biblical authority seriously. Those who do take biblical authority seriously find that this interpretation of Ken Ham's, his insistence on things that are actually extra biblical and go well beyond what the Bible demands, calls for, or tells us, but he demands that we must believe them because he believes the Bible tells us so, right? Undermines the biblical message itself. And this is why it's not successful over time. It falls away over time because it lacks a truly comprehensive, full understanding of Scripture that makes sense of this world. Now, as we ring in 2017, remember I wrote this when the Ark Encounter was getting, it was the year the Ark Encounter was really under construction. Ken Ham once again conjures up the image of Martin Luther and the Reformation he began at the, as the AIG theme for 2017. This is the reason I wrote this original blog post, because he wrote about how the theme for the year, Answers in Genesis theme for the year was about biblical reformation. Ken Ham frequently likened himself in the previous year to the prophet Nehemiah, calling the people to rebuild the wall. In this case, I guess, rebuild the ark. For example, last year, Ken Ham rejected a dinner request from Dr. Deborah Harzma, who is president of the Science and Faith Organization Biologos. And the way he rejected her was by quoting Nehemiah 6.3. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Right? He quotes that verse. Why? I don't have time. I can't come down off of my high and mighty work to come down and talk to you and have a conversation with you. You who I think is a compromiser and undermining biblical authority. I can't come talk to another Christian who I disagree with because I have a greater work to do. So he responds after that quote, that, that, that verse. We at AIG are busy rebuilding a wall. We are equipping God's people to defend the Christian faith. And I believe that we are doing a great work for God. We're busy being watchmen, warning people of those who undermine the authority of the Word of God. And for the past five, six years, all right, since he wrote this, he has been up in the ante in terms of calling people out, all right, calling all kinds of theologians out, all kinds of pastors out, calling other individuals within the church that have some kind of voice who have been opposing him. And under the auspices of he is, um, he needs to do that because he has to call out those who oppose him because that's what God's called him to do. This year, he again compares the work of his apologetics ministry to the 15th century reform movement and like himself to the founder, Martin Luther. He is calling for a new reformation, calling the church to repent from their compromising ways and return to biv true biblical authority. Of course, he assumes, he assumes that his interpretations of biblical authority are those that the world should follow. I find the proposed inseparable connection between biblical authority and the young earth creation 
proposition to be dubious, especially since Christians in the Reformed theological tradition, those that are born out of the Reformation, those who hold most closely to the tenets of either Lutheranism or what we call Calvinism, all right? The Reformed theological tradition. Those who are in that particular tradition have been some of the most resistant to Ken Ham's ideas, most resistant to listening to his form of biblical authority. They've been staunch advocates, right? Those who are in the Reformed Church, and I have this picture of this uh, book that's uh, like a guide to what is a Reformed Church. And if you look at the tenets of what makes a Reformed Church, ones that follow in the Reformed tradition, of course, there's a huge emphasis on biblical authority in all areas of what we call practice in faith. It's largely within this tradition that I would say that the deepest, most meaningful exposition of Genesis 1 and 2 has occurred. And through that, remaining, they have been remaining faithful to what we would call a high view of Scripture. And they have concluded, many of those theologians, if not most of those Reformed theologians, have concluded that these passages, Genesis 1 and 2, are not foremost about the age of the earth. And in fact, leave the question open as to the physical age of the earth and open to inquiry through God's general revelation. That God has called us to examine this world and to bring glory to God by, by discovering the methods and means that God has formed this world. So, in many ways, George McFrady Price was the Ken Ham of the early 20th century, right? He was clearly a modern creationist, but he has now been nearly forgotten today, right? How many people are talking about George McCready Price? How many people are reading his books? Hardly anyone. Will Ken Ham be likewise ignored by counterparts 100 years from now? I expect he'll be remembered much longer than George McCready Price. Ken Ham has, has built a multimedia empire that will continue on for quite some time. Given that his modern version of flood geology is not developed any real new insights into Earth's geology, and that it's founded on the principles of the church that has rejected in the past multiple times, and a considerable portion of the movement's success is due to what? Personality-driven forces? and also a connection to say culture wars and other issues as if it's like a package deal, All right? And I'll, I'll include just like, just basic scare tactics on the church. You know, don't think, just believe as I say, God said it, I believe it, but don't think about it, all right? Don't try to inspect what God has said or try to understand it better. I believe it best. Young Earth creationism is going to wax and wane in popularity over time. But a reformation that will sweep the world and see the current scientific theories replaced with a 300-year-old discarded idea, not likely. Not likely. Not going to happen. While the Ministry of Answers in Genesis claims to represent biblical authority and therefore appears to stand on what they would call capital T Truth, it places that very same biblical authority on the shaky grounds of the scientific tenets of flood geology and young earth creationism more generally. The scientific tenets of that foundation are, I believe, demonstrably false, and thus a reformation underpinning, underpinned by creation science. It's just not going to occur. Being reformed and maintaining the capacity to continue reform, semper reformanda, means holding to the truths expressed in God's authoritative word while being mindful that the spirit of truth always leads the church into all truth. And since no church may assume that she knows everything as she ought to know, the church today may be able to see further, understand more deeply, and develop beyond what its fathers did. Will answers in Genesis find success in the coming year? By many measures, I am sure they will. I predict they'll garner lots more donations than they did the year before. Now, looking back, yes, they did. And have they got any more donations this year? Yes. And will they have more next year? Quite likely. They'll sell more materials. They'll have more talks. They'll have, they'll have bigger audiences. The Ark Encounter will be seen by a million people than it was in its first year. All of this is going to be hailed by Answers in Genesis as a huge success and will be used to testify to the faithfulness of their witness. 
But will it be a real success or will the success be akin to the success we have seen in other parachurch or megachurch organizations or operations? But the key question here is, will Answers in Genesis be truly a godly success story? Or is it just going to be a temporary success story? I mean, temporary can be 50 years or 100 years. All right? Is it a temporary success? Does it have the appearance of true revival simply because many say, yay, many, they, follow, they, they gain many followers? All right? Is it a true revival or is it, is it true reformation? Or is it simply, like I said before, a temporal thing? Now, I had also suggested a number of books uh, written by, and here's the thing I want to emphasize here, written by Reformed theologians in the Reformed tradition. And these Reformers, I would say, feel, you know, would trace their roots all the way back to the 1500s uh, and Calvin and Luther and so forth in that time. Um, you know, Calvin, 1600s. All right, we've got uh, God's Pattern for Creation, a covenantal reading of Genesis 1, one of my favorite small books that it kind of gives a, the big picture of what the intent of the authors is in terms of the, the main messages of Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, then you have more of a, a commentary, uh, a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, look at Genesis 1 to 4. So this linguistic, literary, and theological commentary by John C. Collins, who is a Presbyterian Church of America, so that's a Reformed denomination. Um, he's also written uh, this book on science and faith. Right, friends or foe. And then we've got one of my favorite authors because it's just been one of the most impactful things that I've read. Uh, the Erosion of Inerrancy and Evangelicalism, Responding to the New Challenges of Biblical Authority. Hmm, yeah, all right. So he's defending biblical authority, all right? Because he's talking about how, yes, there is an erosion of biblical authority within the church. And so you think, can him be really excited about a book like this? Uh, the thing is, G.K. Beale is writing from a very conservative perspective on um, uh, the nature of scriptures, it has a very high view of scripture, has a high view of the authority of scripture, uh, and is very concerned about scripture being undermined. And then what's fascinating though is the last half of the book goes through an example of the erosion of inerrancy. And in that example, it's talking about perspectives on Genesis, uh, in which he provides a perspective that is clearly not Ken Ham's perspective. And Ken Ham's perspective is actually an, an example of the erosion of inerrancy, right? Inerrancy and biblical authority are being undermined by those like Ken Ham. Now, G.K. Beale is not specifically, like directly talking about uh, Ken Ham, but uh, if you know the literature and you know the types of things he's talking about, you know he's talking about uh, Ken Ham type uh, of stuff. Uh, this is another book that's one of my favorites. And all right, then here's another G.K. Beale book, The Temple and the, Ch and the Church's Mission. Again, one of my favorite books. And if you've heard me talk about the Garden of Eden, you've undoubtedly heard me use language that comes from this particular book about the Garden of Eden. Extensive discussion of the imagery from the Garden of Eden and then eventually to the tabernacle and then to the temple and then how that relates to the church today. And so this is an overarching analysis of scripture uh, showing how the purpose of the representation of the Garden of Eden uh, and how that plays itself out through the rest of scriptures. Um, there's also a simpler version uh, of this particular book that's not quite as technical called God Dwells Among Us, the expanding Eden into the ends of the world, how Eden was supposed to the, the vision of Eden is supposed to spread across the world, and that, that is represented in the language all the way through Revelation. And so as I say here, neither of these books directly address the age of the earth or other science and faith questions. He's not, he's not talking about the things that I usually talk about. But both of these books promote a really full-orbed approach to interpreting scriptures in which the creation account plays a really central role, right? In, in framing the history of the world and our purpose in it and God's relationship to us. So the cosmic temple interpretation of the Garden of Eden is presented by Beale here and picked up by people like Walton, who's probably a much more famous in terms of his, uh, uh, I, I guess, more people have read Walton and his popularization. 
Uh, I mean, I'll just end here by saying that I'm, I'm saying there's a lot of Reformed theologians, pastors, people in Reformed church who follow the um, historical Reformed theology, right, or historical Reformed traditions, who are very much not of the ilk of Ken Ham. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't uh, strains of young earth creationism within um, the Reformed tradition, those who follow the Reformed tradition. In fact, the Reformed church is split into many, many, many small denominations in many cases. And some of those denominations, one of their distinctives is that they, they are young earth, right? That they believe in six day creation. Uh, and so that, that is something that makes them distinctive as opposed to others. Um, but that historically hasn't been the case. That's just, in my mind, an infiltration from outside of the Reformed tradition uh, that has been brought into it. That wouldn't be the original tradition. I mean, Ken Ham can talk about how he thinks that Luther and Calvin would be young earth creationists today if they were alive today. But that would be a little bit of, I mean, it's always dangerous and hard to interpret how somebody from 500 years ago would think today if they had all the things available today for them to see and analyze. Uh, and Ken Ham, of course, will try to claim all those historical characters for his side. I personally feel like uh, that wouldn't be the case. And even reading the writings from the time in which they lived, you can see plenty of hints that would suggest they would not be your, your Ken Ham type young earth creationist today. Um, and so Ken Ham is a modern manifestation of a aberration of Christianity, um, which likes to try to claim history and likes to claim that they are uh, the theologically conservative element that uh, God is sustaining through all of history. And, and, and Ken Ham is like right there as like God's primary minister for maintaining the faithfulness of holding to biblical authority. What, I mean, honestly, the word biblical authority is very poorly defined for Ken Ham. That's, that's the reason. It's such a, it's such like a catchy word to say, um, but it's a slippery word to, to kind of grab onto. It, it's just one of those things where you can say like, because he doesn't believe, because somebody doesn't believe something, they don't believe in the authority of, of scripture. All right. The authority of God. And if they believe what I believe, then they must believe in the authority of God. Right. It, instead of having a discrete definition of it that we can like actually analyze. Yeah, I, I guess I get a little perturbed by uh, Ken Ham talking about, you know, the Reformation since I come from a Reformed theological background and am, uh, you know, inclined toward most of Reformed theology. And so uh, for him to kind of claim that mantle and to say, like, he's a Reformer, uh, it just really rubs me the wrong way. This really does. Um, all right, I'm going to quit there. That's it for Ham Bites. I'll be back. We'll talk about some some other things that uh, Ken Ham has said recently that have also kind of uh, got me um, perturbed enough to feel like I need to say something publicly about it. All right, till then, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.